Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, we're here to praise the Lord, to worship Him, to honor Him. And uh, we're going to open up with a song, Come to the Altar. Uh, the visual of that song is coming to God. So we come to God with our hearts, our whole hearts, knowing that He's here. And, uh, and we worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let's stand together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy And the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Sing it again. Oh, come to the altar. blood of Jesus Christ Oh what a savior Oh what a savior Jesus. Why don't 
Would you bow your heads? Just come before the Lord this morning. Just greet him in the privacy of your own heart. Anything's on your mind that you want to share with him, silently just share that. Worship him. Just take a few moments to come to the altar before him. from your heart. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. You are the same God. 
You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a Savior then. You are a Savior now. You are the same God.
none like you, Lord. There is none like you. There is none besides. We love you, Lord. You may be seated. Children, go on. You're released to go to the junction. Welcome to Edgewood Church. We are so glad to have you here. My name is Ben Bullock, and I, I serve on the worship team. I serve in, in children's ministry and a few other places around here. Um, I'd love to, sh- to share to you guys today's announcements and, and get you up to speed on, on the things we have going on. If you're new to Edgewood, I would love for you to fill out your connection cards. Those are going to be in your bulletin. Get those filled out for us. That'd be awesome. On the back of those cards, we have a spot for prayer requests. So if, if you've got anything you need going on or anything to praise about, because there's so much to praise God about, Put those on the back and, and hand those in at the back of the sanctuary when we're done. Um, secondly, next Sunday on October 13th, we're going to have the official installation service for our new pastor, Ronnie Harris. Um, yeah. That's going to start at 1045, as it usually does. Um, but after the service, we're going to have a potluck down in the gym. So a great time to eat some good food. Um, so if you would love to bring uh, one of your favorite foods or favorite dishes, we, we'd love to, to have you bring that and, and share it with the rest of the church community. That'd be awesome. Um, you're not going to want to miss next Sunday. It's going to be pretty special and pretty cool. Finally, on October 20th, in a few Sundays, we're going to have our semi-annual business meeting at 1045. If you're a member here at Edgewood, we would love for you to plan on attending because you're going you're to hear a lot of information about the things we have going on here at church. Once again, thank you for being here at Edgewood. We're glad to have you here. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ronnie. I'm the uh, senior pastor here. If I have not met you, welcome. Um, normally, or in the past, we would have our offering right now, and we pass some baskets around and stuff. Um, we are not going to do that this morning, and, and I'm going to tell you why, though. So we have a, a verse that's going to come up here on the, on the board here. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if we have visitors and stuff like that, um, we don't want to have them have a basket come in front of them, and they're like, what, the, what happens is they look down, and they're like, okay, the three people next to me didn't give money, so I don't have to give money, so then they pass it. Or somebody gives like a $20 bill, and they're like, I got to give like $25 now. So in order to avoid that, we're going to not pass the baskets, but um, you can still give here at Edgewood, of course. Um, there is a uh, box in the back that if you brought um, cash or checks, and that, that's your normal rhythm, um, we're going to just ask that you do that before service or after service. But every service, we're definitely going to highlight um, just the fact that um, the stewardship of this church is a, a part of one of our core values and stuff. And so um, I am going to pray real quick uh, over just uh, giving in general. And then if you have brought something today that you would like to give after service is over, you can just put it in the box in the back. If you're visiting, um, no pressure because we don't want you to give under compulsion. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, for the gifts, uh, the resources, the time, the energy that you have blessed us all with, Lord. And uh, uh, some have uh, much, some have less, Lord, but uh, what's important is uh, our hearts towards you. And we just want to thank you that um, you uh, invite us to participate in your uh, creation and your plan, uh, governing the planet, managing the planet. And Lord, everything that we have is yours, and we just want to acknowledge that, uh, which includes our money. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless everyone in here that um, is a a regular giver, a every every once in a while giver, Lord, and just uh, thank you for uh, the people that have decided in their heart to make Edgewood their home. Uh, and to give their time and resources. And so we just uh, ask that you would multiply that and bless that for your purposes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks.
And good morning again. <laughs> All right, well, uh, again, welcome. If, uh, if you're uh, newer, I haven't met you, it's great to have you here uh, this morning. We are continuing with our sermon series in the book of Luke, uh, and the subtitle for that is That You May Have Certainty. Um, this week, I was actually up in Stanwood for a couple days. We actually had a pastor's conference uh, for Converge Northwest, which is the association that our church belongs to. Um, churches, over 150 of them from Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Oregon. And the motto of the group uh, of us being uh, together is, uh, we are better together. And so it's great to be able to get together with other pastors, hear stories of uh, things that are going on in other churches around the Northwest that are um, on the same path as we are and uh, trying to proclaim the, the name of Jesus and, um, and serve together as a church. The title for this particular conference was Next, and so we were looking at the next decade, actually, 2025 to 2035. So what's next for our churches and, and our, uh, assuming we're still here and Jesus doesn't come back, because, you know, that could happen any time. Uh, but we're going to plan, we're going to be ready for that, but then at the same time, we're going to plan uh, as well. And so the theme of the conference, so the title was next, the theme was based on Philippians 1.27, and I think that's going to be up on the board. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then Nate Hedega, our uh, regional president, actually kind of uh, paraphrased it and says, whatever happens, keep walking with Jesus. And then throughout the conference, for uh, the day that we were there, there was a pre-conference on Wednesday as well. He just kept saying, whatever happens. Whatever happens, keep walking with Jesus. So that is the theme of your uh, pastor uh, and, and pastors around Converge. Now, one of the reasons that uh, they were talking about this is because in the last four years alone, there has been 40 senior pastor transitions in our district. And to give you an idea of how that compares, the previous 10 years had four senior pastor transitions. So in the last four years, there was more than 40 pastor transitions. And so uh, that is partly the ripple effect of COVID um, that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been tough on a lot of churches uh, just not making it through COVID. And it could be a, very, a, a lot of reasons, but certainly pastoral burnout would be one of those. And so um, I actually wasn't in vocational ministry during COVID, so I have fresh legs. And wh what that means is, uh, you know, if you play basketball or football, the person coming off the bench, they have fresh legs. They have a lot of energy and excitement. So I have fresh legs for Edgewood. Um, so that, that's a good thing. And so uh, over the next uh, 6 to 12 months uh, here at Edgewood, uh, we're going to be talking about stuff, about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And I'll be communicating from the pulpit, you know, things like, why do we even exist as a church? Um, what do we do, and how are we going to do it? And so the questions that are the most important about anything, who, what, where, why, and when, uh, those are the questions we're going to be talking about over the next 6 to uh, 12 months. And so even, even on stage, you see a, a few new banners here with uh, Believe, Become, Belong, and Build is kind of a sneak peek on the four Bs um, of starting next week, I'm going to have a five-week sermon series um, and the title of it is going to be, I'm a bee. And so uh, the question is, uh, which bee are you? And maybe you're all of them, maybe you're none of them, maybe you're somewhere in between, but this is going to be like the foundation, kind of the foundational concepts of, uh, of really the Christian life, um, looking at belief and, and uh, uh, looking at salvation and sanctification and what it means to belong to a church and what it means to grow in your faith and specifically here at Edgewood. And so that's, that's what we're going to be looking forward to. So next week at the installation service will be uh, the first sermon series. It would be a great time to invite uh, friends or family that don't normally come, again, because it's kind of a vision cast. It's the start of vision casting. So um, there's going to be five weeks on, on this stuff, and then we're going to have another six, six weeks on another sermon series related to... Uh, the values that we're going to have at Edgewood and stuff. So anyway, exciting times. Glad you're here. Uh, you didn't even know it, but it's exciting. And remember, I have fresh legs. So um, 
This is going to be good. So today, though, we're still in Luke because God's Word is sufficient. So uh, yes, I'm going to do some sermon series that are, that are uh, you know, dare I say the word topical, but it's going to be biblically based. Um, but at the same time, we uh, uh, like to preach um, just through books of the Bible as well. And we're in Luke chapter 8, and we have two more amazing accounts of Jesus' display of power over life and death, um, and specifically his compassion towards desperate people. Uh, and, and people that are on the opposite ends of society, uh, a person that's at the high point of society and a person that's more marginalized and outcast. So really, this uh, sermon applies to everybody in this room, no matter where, where, you, where you fall. And the big idea uh, is that Jesus responds with life-changing power to the desperate pleas of both the prominent and the marginalized. And that's the setting that we're going to uh, walk into uh, the end of Luke chapter 8. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just read the verses we're going to go over today, uh, part of them, because the, there's a lot of verses, so we're going to take them in chunks. So uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 40 says, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a, name named, uh, sorry, there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had only only an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. So let's just uh, start this morning by praying, if you bow with me. Lord, thank you so much uh, for today. Thank you that you are God. Uh, You are the creator of this earth. Uh, You have um, blessed us uh, to be um, called yours. And Lord, uh, just thank you so much that uh, we can have that uh, knowledge and that security and that uh, love and grace that you pour out to us uh, through your word, through... um, uh, each of us that uh, know you and follow you, and Lord, I pray that you would just open our hearts and minds and ears this morning to uh, uh, be changed, to be transformed by your word, the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so first question is, where was Jesus returning from? And that was, if you were here last week, from casting out demons from a gentleman that was uh, a very unstable person. Uh, The demons were cast into 2,000 pigs that then ran off the cliff and drowned in the sea. Uh, And this man, who had a legion of demons in him, it was a pretty um, wild story, after uh, those demons left him, he was calm. He was not naked and afraid anymore, for those that were here last week. We talked a little bit about that. Um, he was in his, right man, in his right mind, and he was sitting at Jesus' feet. But the townsfolk, the people that came out to see what happened, all the commotion, they actually didn't respond with awe and amazement. They actually responded with fear and, and great fear. So much fear at Jesus' power, they said, leave. Leave us. And Jesus left them. And so uh, Jesus and the disciples then go back across the lake And then they arrive near Capernaum again, and that's where we pick up where uh, people were waiting for him. He returned to the crowd. They welcome him, and we're introduced to the first name, Jairus, who is a prominent Jewish elite. Uh, Right away, we know that this man is desperate. He is desperate because he is a synagogue ruler. This is not somebody that would go to Jesus and plead with Jesus and ask Jesus to do something for him because, again, a lot of the Jewish elite and rulers, they were not liking Jesus' words, the fact that Jesus was doing things that uh, made him sound like God. And so even though people were being healed previously, uh, they were, th- these guys were not liking Jesus. And yet, Jairus falls before him and implores him to come to his house and save his only daughter who's 12 and dying. And so again, desperation is what uh, Jarius was feeling. He has a daughter who's only 12 years old, who obviously he does not want to die. Then we also are introduced to a woman who has no name. She's just uh, described as an unclean woman. 
that has had 12 years of a blood disease that could not be solved by physicians. She spent all of her money going to different people trying to figure out what is wrong with her. She's, sh- she's shamed, she's isolated, she is desperate, she is outcast, and she is broke. So again, she's out of ideas, she's exhausted all of them, and so these are the two people we're introduced here. You know, the contrast between the two, like I said at the very beginning, is very interesting. Uh, Jarius is named, the woman is not named. He's had 12 years of joy with a daughter. Uh, This woman has had 12 years of misery with a disease that has affected every aspect of her life. He is wealthy and a community leader. She is a nobody and she is unclean, which which puts her out of the community. So other observations, just uh, if we think about, again, trying to understand uh, the desperation of these people, uh, it, the fear of death, certainly for Jarius, was there. You know, every, everyone and everything is, is dying. Uh, newsflash, we are all dying. Uh, and the fear of death is really the ultimate fear. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, how old you are. If death is close to you, um, it causes fear. And certainly those without God, uh, it, it causes a great deal of fear. And, and people in the medical community, um, you know, and, and people that don't have a God in their worldview, uh, they think they're going to eventually unlock the secret of life. Uh, that's why we have medicine, uh, so many medicine advancements, which is great, but at the same time, the ultimate goal is to uh, solve the problem of death. Um, now, of course, as Christ followers, we, uh, we know that death is not the end. Physical death is not the end. Uh, God has more in store for us. It's not just chemistry and material that we are made of. It's actually uh, we have a soul inside of us. We were God-breathed into living. And so, again, we can have a hope that goes beyond this life. And, and we know this because God planned it all out. Uh, he laid out this plan in Scripture. He had it from the beginning until uh, the culmination of human history that not only do we have this life, but we have a life in front of us that is uh, unfathomable. It's going to be so good we can't even imagine how good it's going to be. Now, people try to do that. I mentioned a book uh, a few weeks back called uh, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. I think it's a, it's a great a great kind of like uh, a primer in your mind to be like, okay, what, what is heaven going to be like? Um, and, and on one hand, we don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but there's a lot of clues in the Bible that uh, uh, tell us this, um, kind of give us an understanding of what it could be like. Um, but all we do know is that it's going to be better than we can even imagine. But nevertheless, death is still hard for all of us. Um, when people that you love die, it hurts. Um, Certainly premature, premature death is shocking, and the death of a young child is, is tragic. I have, I have journeyed with families in my pastoral life um, that uh, one of uh, a kid from my youth group, once he went to college, he was murdered um, at a 7-Eleven on a Saturday night after he played in a college football game. And I got a call at 1 a.m. from the parents, um, and that is a phone call that no pastor ever wants to get. Um, and, and I've uh, journeyed and, and watched this uh, family over time, and um, I don't know what it's like. Uh, I have not lost a child, but I, I do know uh, watching that it is horrendous. Uh, the grief uh, never ends. Um, it, is, it is really unfathomable for those that have not experienced that. Um, and so the ache never leaves. There's never not a wonder of what would life have been like um, if their child had uh, continued. And so this Jewish leader has a 12-year-old daughter who is dying. And so this is, this is his mindset. The, the ultimate uh, fear is real to Jarius. And then for the unclean woman, uh, I mean, she is already living in isolation for over a decade. She has already spent all her money, gone to people, tried to solve her problem, um, and, and is not able to even function like anything uh, remotely normal for her uh, culture. Um, She is not able to gather like this with other uh, followers of her faith. She's not able to be around people. She can't touch people. She can't be hugged. She's unclean. And so even though she is living, it's like she's living a very empty life. And so um, this is the, the standpoint of these two 
Um, you know, and Jesus is known in the region. So uh, when, when uh, this unclean woman approaches Jesus, this is quite taboo and scandalous. Again, she is unclean, and so she is approaching uh, crowds and people and then someone who is prominently known in Jesus. And so she is breaking all kinds of norms. She is taking risks of getting caught, of being noticed, and, and with any of that become uh, potential consequences for her. So let's gonna, we're going to jump back into the um, passage, uh, verse 44. It says that she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who is it that touched me? When all had denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, if you think about this, if you really put a little bit of thought into just think about how this played out, this is fascinating. She thinks, she's trying to get close to Jesus. She thinks, if I can just touch him, I will be healed. This is unprecedented. This is not recorded in Scripture. If it, maybe it happened and it's not recorded, but there's a good chance that this had not happened yet. Now, Jesus had touched people Jesus had intended to heal people. We have seen that already. But he had, at least uh, outwardly, he had no intention of healing her. And yet, he's walking around. People are pressed against him. Someone doesn't even touch his actual personhood, his body. They just grab the tassel, and then they're healed. And so spiritual life-giving power leaves Jesus, and he can feel that power go out of him. And that power goes to this woman. She can feel the power of Jesus. This is, this is awesome. This is an amazing story. And Peter, who's always quick with a judgment on a situation, he's like frustrated with Jesus. Like, Jesus, what are you talking about? There's people everywhere, you know? I, I can just imagine, like, hear the sarcasm of him. Like, Jesus, what are you talking about? What do you mean, who touched me? So, one of the questions is, have you ever felt like this? Like, this woman. Like, you are in disarray. Uh, you don't know what's going on. Uh, you, you don't know what's happening with your job or your family or your body. There's so many things that in life that can boggle our minds. We don't understand the moment. Maybe you're like Peter and you're like, Jesus, what, what are you even talking about? But the cool thing is answers come. When you walk with Jesus and trust Jesus, answers will come. Why? Because Jesus is the center of everything. Jesus is the very power that generates life and sustains life. Just a reminder, we're going to jump to Colossians 1, verse 15 through 17. It says this, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him, we're talking about Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him, this is the verse right here. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. If you don't have an answer to life that you're looking for, if you don't understand a situation that you're in, keep walking with Jesus. Again, this is the theme for our pastor conference, keep walking with Jesus. He holds on to life-giving power, power that can transform you and transform your life, power to heal, power to restore. The question is, why does Jesus need this explanation of like, who touched me? Why does Jesus need that? It appears that he doesn't know what happened. I mean, he felt the power go out for him, but it appears like he doesn't know what happened. But he needs to know 
for full redemptive purposes. He wasn't just going to allow this power to happen to go out for him without a complete restoration of the physical and the spiritual. So he has everyone participate, his disciples, the people that are close by. Hey, who touched me? Who touched me? And everyone's like, I didn't touch you. And he wants the girl, the woman, excuse me, to be, to be known, to, to come out of hiding. Why? So that she can be restored. Not just physically, she was already healed physically, but to be restored spiritually. No, he was demonstrating his power also so that her faith would be on display. So she told him, if I knew that if I just touched you, I would be healed, and his reply is your faith has healed you. First point for today is that faith requires action. Faith requires action. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. This unclean woman took a bold risk. She sought him out. She pushed through the crowds. She grabbed his tassel at at great risk to her. Again, her condition was desperate. And so desperation leads to risk-taking a lot of times. And risk-taking can lead to reward. Her belief combined with her action, led to her condition changing. Sometimes in life, we have to take a step towards God. We have to take that step. We have to actually have some action. And depending on what your situation is, that could be all kinds of things. We have to seek God. We have to push through the obstacles that either are in our mind or maybe they're real out there. And we have to go way beyond our comfort zone to experience the power of God in our lives. That, that's what happened in this story. I, there's other stories of, of, of faith-filled experiences that maybe are a little bit different, but all I know is that right here, faith was combined with action. Now, here's the problem for many people. Here's the problem for many of us in America, in Washington, in Edmonds, in this room. Nobody's desperate. We're not desperate. I mean, some people could be in des- desperate situations. I realize that. I want to account for that. But, you know, we're just comfortable. And we, we get used to just life being comfortable because we live in a pretty comfortable life. Even me, I'm in the middle of my life. Even me saying that is presumptive that I've lived half my life and i got a half to go or some percentage thereof. <laughs> but, you know, why do, I, why do I act like that? Why do I think like that? Because... Uh, Swedish Edmonds is right down the road. My phone is right in my pocket. I mean, if I just go down right now, I can call 911. If I can't, all of you will, hopefully. Will you guys call 911 for me? Okay. I mean, we just have safety around us. We have comfort around us. And even if something happens, even if somebody has a heart attack right now, there's a good chance their life can be saved. We're pretty comfortable. We're not desperate. Yesterday, I was um, walking around Green Lake for the Seattle Kraken 5K. Now, this was an event that actually my daughter, Melissa, thought of, created, planned, and executed. So, proud dad moment. 2,500 people there, sold out. Um, Really big to do. It was pretty awesome. Um, So then my other daughter, Hannah, and I, and my son-in-law, and uh, another coworker of Melissa's, she was working, so she wasn't going around uh, Green Lake with us. But I was just, um, we were about at four kilometers in, and, you know, I noticed this, this man who, j- he was kind of like leaning pretty heavy, right? And so, um, you know, for the last four kilometers, I tend to just watch people and make commentary to my, to my family. Just, just, you know, just, I notice stuff like, oh, that person, you know, they kind of like do their arms like this or whatever, you know, and I'm not making fun of them. I'm just making observations, um, but I had been doing this for four kilometers, and so, no joke, I am, I, I, I'm seeing this guy, we're walking, and I see this gentleman, who's an older gentleman, he's walking, and, and he's, he's, like, he's like walking like this, and I had already been seeing a lot of, you know, funny looking things, the whole, the whole four kilometers, and I say the sentence, I'm like, that guy's going to fall down. As soon as I said those words, he fell down, and he, he was literally like five feet away from me. So I, I rush over and, and sat next to him, and he leaned on my body uh, because he was just kind of shaken. He was 83 years old, um, 
and his name is Stu, and he was just, he wasn't even a part of the whole Seattle Kraken 5K. He was just walking around Green Lake. Um, but, you know, immediately, um, Nicole, who is uh, my, my daughter's coworker, whips out her phone, calls my daughter. My daughter's standing next to the paramedic table, and then the paramedic starts coming. Now, unfortunately, he was a volunteer uh, paramedic, and he took a long time because he had to walk a whole kilometer. So it took a little bit. But we were there. There was, like, you know, a group of, like, eight of us around kind of tending to Stu while we were waiting for the paramedic. Then the paramedic came. So all that to say, we feel safe. We feel safe even if, even if you go down. Even if you go down, we feel pretty safe. We're not desperate. We think we're generally okay. And then later in life, you know, you start getting, you know, uh, cancer screenings, colonoscopies, breast uh, mammograms and stuff, right? But then all of a sudden, what happens? Maybe you, there's a diagnosis of cancer. This happened to, to a friend of mine, a former coworker of mine. Uh, she was a healthy 52. Uh, I saw her at the gym every single week. And then all of a sudden, she went in for a routine colonoscopy, and she woke up to a stage four cancer diagnosis, colorectal cancer. Her life has changed. The fear of death is, is there. Um, she had another high school friend that was diagnosed the same time she was. He was dead within a year. She's still with us five years later, which is amazing. Praise God for that. But reality hits hard when the diagnosis comes. All that to say is that we, we, we get comfortable, we're not really desperate, we get in our routines, we think we got all kinds of years in front of us, um, you know, but we, we can uh, sit in our uh, heated homes and turn on the fire and have a hot cup of tea on a cold, uh, wintry night and the storm is outside and it's, it's no big deal. We're not, we're not desperate. I mean, there's so many things that uh, cause desperation that are so dumb. Last week, who has Verizon? And last week, you didn't have cell service for half a day. I became a desperate man. I, I, I was like, I can't just look at Facebook anytime I want to like I normally do. I can't call people. I felt naked and afraid. Like, I mean, I just didn't feel good, right? Uh, and it was only for like six hours. Uh, and if I was in a building that had Wi-Fi, I could text my family and my daughter, Hannah, is like, what is going on? The world is ending, you know. We're pampered, folks. We have to admit it. It's not just me. Um, but desperation compels risk. The unclean woman was desperate for Jesus to heal her, and he did, physically and spiritually. And the second point, after faith requires action, is that faith res results in redemption. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Not only did she take a risk to go touch Jesus in the first place, she had to step up and tell him why she did it. And what she did. She had to confess. She had to come forward, forward as a witness to what Jesus had done, what had happened to her in her life. Again, she came forward hum trembling in humility, confessing. Jesus not only healed her body, but because of this coming forward, she was restored to her community. Her life was transformed. She was made whole, not just physically, spiritually, socially. And Jesus called her daughter. You know, it doesn't explicitly say that she was saved at that moment, but certainly she sounds like a child of God there. He called her daughter. You know, we focus on the miracles of Jesus a lot of times, and, and the physical is what we kind of like highlight and think about. And even if we think about like uh, miracles today, we're like, you know, oh, if, if, if God would heal whoever I know that has whatever sickness, and, and, and we want that, and Certainly, we are supposed to take all of our uh, desires to, to God and pray for those, but you know, it's not, all, it's not always God's will for someone's life to be extended. Again, we are all dying. We will all die. And that's a reality that we have to face. And so while, yes, it's, it's, it's good to ask God for more life, but if God doesn't get it, it, give it, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, doesn't care for us, doesn't have a plan, hasn't thought this through. God is bigger than us. So we focus a lot of times on our physical life and not on our spiritual life. There's a verse that I like that I've always been one of my favorite verses, kind of because it, you know, it has an athletic uh, 
uh, application, but 1 Timothy 4.8 says this, for while bodily training is of some value, it's, it's valuable, it's valuable to take care of your body, to work out, eat good, that is value. Godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So our bodies are obviously important to us, and when our bodies don't work, it, it like stops us in our tracks. Uh, my wife, God bless her, she pushes herself until she collapses. <laughs> she is home today. She's sick. She, she's been fighting this thing for a few days, and she just is like, can't get out of bed now. <laughs> I, I'm different. I, I'm like, if I feel something coming, I'm like working in naps and taking stuff, and she just goes until she can't go anymore. Her body just says, you cannot go anymore. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump back into the text. We're still reading in uh, the final passage here, and we're going to look at uh, the second part of this uh, two miracles, Jairus' daughter. Verse 49, it says, While he, Jesus, was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, Jesus, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the father and mother of the child, and all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged, he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Point three, faith is greater than fear. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. You see, faith starts with belief. Belief. Before your circumstances change. Faith starts at hearing the word of God and believing. Remember back uh, a few weeks ago, the parable of the soils, parable of the sower. Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear. At Jesus' word, what has happened so far in the book of Luke? Luke, demons flee. At Jesus' word, diseases no longer exist and can destroy people's lives. At Jesus' word, withered hands are restored. At Jesus' word, storms cease and waves calm. And at Jesus' word, the dead rise. The fear of death is conquered by faith in Jesus. And while you and I are living on this earth, we can place all of our fears with Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So this morning, are you casting all of your anxiety on Jesus? It's actually just a conscious decision. It's an act of your will to decide that you're going to put your anxieties with God. So I'm a parent, and for all those parents out there, um, do we fear for our kids? Yes, we fear for our kids because they do dumb stuff because we were kids once that did dumb stuff so we know what they do. Uh, when I, between the ages of 16 and 19, I had six tickets, five speeding, one rolling through a stop sign. I had four accidents, two of them my fault. God bless my mom. <laughs> I'm probably alive because she was praying for me <laughs> all these times, right? Uh, some of you have stories, I know, that, that are uh, equal or greater to mine. I know John Walker does. He's shared a few of mine, a few of his stories. <laughs> but as, as Christ followers, we have to cast our fears on Jesus for our kids, for our careers, for our relationships, for everything, for the Seahawk game. It's okay. You can cast your fear to Jesus. He'll take them all. So... Remember, somebody came from Jairus' house and said, your daughter has died. His worst fear was realized. 
Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. And he's saying this in the context of someone's worst fear already being realized. Got to keep believing. Got to keep walking with Jesus, whatever happens. God loves you and is there for you. And just like the theme of the pastors heard last week, whatever happens, keep walking with Jesus. Pastors need to hear this too, right? All people need to be reminded that whatever happens, bad stuff, cancer diagnosis, job loss, relationship breakup, a loved one dying, believe that Jesus will restore. Now sometimes that restoration is gonna be in the next life. Everything doesn't just flip around how you want it. But sometimes that restoration is just not far down the road, and sometimes that restoration is right in front of us. It's right around the corner. You know, when Jesus went into Jairus' house with Peter and James and John along with the parents, there was weeping and there was mourning. And Jesus said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him knowing she was dead. And you know what? They were right. They were actually correct. She was dead. Now, of course, Jesus had other plans, but as far as they knew, she had died. So the fourth point today is we have to believe that Jesus is capable. Verse 54, but taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given to her to eat, and her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one about what happened. See, resurrection is a picture of the way Jesus Christ saves the lost, sinners you and, like you and me, and raises them to, from spiritual death. Again, we always focus on the physical, but the most important thing is the spiritual part of our lives. The Gospels record some of these resurrections, although there's probably more, because in John it says there would be endless books written if they recorded everything that Jesus had done. Each time a person is raised from the dead that's recorded, we see evidence of life. So the widow's son, back in chapter 7 of Luke, uh, began to speak. Jairus' daughter, she got up and then ate some food. And then Lazarus, which we're going to read about later on, was loosed from his grave clothes. When a sinner is lost and raised from the dead, you can tell it by their speech, their walk, their appetite, their changed clothes. You can't hide life. You know, an interesting note is Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus on three special occasions, this being one of them. They were invited into the house, so like all the crowds and people couldn't come in. There were professional mourners in there, because that's what they did during that time. Besides the family, they had people that would weep and wail. But he only let uh, Peter, James, and John in. And the second time this happened is, uh, again, later on, in, just in chapter 9, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the third time was in the Garden of Gethsemane, close to Jesus' death. Each of these special occasions actually had something to do with death. No doubt that Peter, James, and John were picked for a reason. You know, in the home of Jairus, they learned that Jesus is victorious over death, On the Mount of Transfiguration, they discovered that Jesus would be glorified in his death. And in the Garden of Eden, Eden, not Garden of Eden, (laughs) in the Garden of Gethsemane, they saw that he would surrender to death. You know, John was the last disciple to to die. James was the first disciple to die. And Peter's death was predicted by Jesus. So you think maybe Jesus had a plan? He was bringing them into these situations to prepare them for what was coming. You know, the cool thing is that we can prepare ourselves by what Jesus has already done. Jesus was accessible. Jesus was available. Jesus was compassionate. Jesus Jesus was interruptible. Almost everything that happens that's amazing that we're reading about is Jesus being interrupted. There was a time where he's preaching and they cut a hole in the roof and dropped that guy that was paralyzed. I mean, like, he gets interrupted. He's walking to Jairus' house. He's on an important mission right here to go to Jairus' house to save a daughter and someone grabs his tassel and pulls some power out of him. 
he was interrupted. And then Jesus is just inexhaustible. He is there always. So the question for you and I is, do you realize that? Do you feel that? Jesus is still accessible. He's still available. He's still compassionate. You can still interrupt him. And he's not going to get tired of you calling. So we have to replace fear with faith. Faith requires action. It results in redemption. It's greater than fear, and then you have to believe that Jesus is capable. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, again, your word that we can just get a picture of what you are like, what God is like, the God of the universe, the creator of everything, knows me, loves me, cares for me, thinks about me, wants me to be restored, wants me to cast all my anxieties on him. In times that my worst fears are realized, God wants us to go to him. I pray for everyone in this room that you would just meet people where they're at, Lord. People have fears, people have anxieties, and whatever happens, God, you are there. You know, you care, you love, and you will restore. We believe that. Whether that restoration is later on down the line or that restoration is right in front of us, Lord, I pray for each and every person here, that you would give them faith, that you would give them belief in their life and in their circumstances. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This is Communion Sunday, so if you have not got your, uh, oh, I got stuff already set aside for me, thank you. Um, If you haven't uh, got um, the elements and you would like them, maybe you could just kind of like put up your hand a little bit and we got somebody that could could get you. But, um, you know, this is one of the things that we are called to do as followers of Christ, to remember what Jesus has done on the cross for us. So today, there was a lot of stories about your faith and your action, and these are good, but the, the most amazing thing is that God has done the work for you, that you can be in relationship with him, that you can be restored to him, that you can look forward to the next life with him like every other Christian on earth is looking forward to. And so we're reminded of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot... uh, do enough good things to outweigh our bad things, but that's the beauty, that's the gospel, that's the equalizer, that it's not what you do, it's what God has done. And so Jesus reminded his disciples disciples to uh, remember that this is his body broken for you, take and remember. And likewise, Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you and I, and we are to remember what he did, what he sacrificed for you and for me. Drink and remember Jesus' blood shed for you. Let's stand together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my Riches gain, I count the loss, and for con.
Thank you for being here this morning. Just a couple reminders. We have a membership class all the way down the hall, last room on the left. I forget the number on the door, but uh, if you're signed up, great. If uh, you want to come listen in and you want to just check out what membership looks like at the church, uh, feel free to stop in. That'll be uh, in about maybe 10 minutes uh, since we're bumping up against noon right now. And uh, next week is the installation service. We will have Nate Hedega, our regional president here. Um, so that'll be fun, and we'll start our new sermon series on I'm a B, and, uh, and then we have a uh, semi-annual meeting coming up on the 20th. That'll be after service, not at 1045. Service will be 1045, but after service is over, we'll have an annual meeting and uh, have some stuff to talk about, and so glad you're here, and did you guys see Monday Night Football last, last Monday? Because there was a rookie wide receiver that at the very end of the game caught a ball, scored a touchdown, the Falcons won, he had fresh legs. <laughs> he had fresh legs. So when you have fresh legs, we're looking to score touchdowns. So uh, be blessed, have a great day, we'll see you next week.